Welcome back to the Cartoonist Kayfabe Courtroom. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And we're going to uh, be continuing the Stan Lee deposition in the case of Kirby versus Marvel Comics uh, in uh, sort of in the running for the this this case is the, the ownership of like 45 characters. A lot of characters' names that you, that you know. And uh, you said it before. Might as well say it again, man. This is like potentially the greatest Stan Lee interview that's ever been recorded, man, because the man has to break kayfabe as much as a Stan Lee can possibly do so and give it straight up. Yeah, even in that first part, I, I was enthralled by so many different sections. Just the shuffling around of stories in the uh, in the 50s and 60s whenever he's, he's working there as the editor and the process of that and trying to keep it organized and straight and on deadlines and multiple issues uh, or multiple titles, you know, running through that. It's, it's mind bending in a way, but that's part of what I wanted to get out of this was like really dive into the minutia, show us day to day operations in Marvel Comics and uh, that first chapter really delivered as far as I'm concerned. We don't know what we're going to be getting into here. Like, this is a 100-page deposition, 100 and yeah, nine-page deposition. Uh, lots of information in here. We don't know where we're getting into, man, but we're going to be getting deep into the Marvel method, I bet you. I mean, we did, we did that last time on the last episode. There's process stuff that I love, and, and again, part of what I wanted to get out of this, but there's also just almost history of Marvel. Absolutely. You know, stands there so long, I'm, I'm interested in all of it. I want to see Marvel develop, you know, as the Marvel Universe grows. I'm yeah. sure we're going to get into some of that. So it's exciting, like you say, best best Stan Lee interview that, that I've come across. Here's how the game is played. Uh, there are about five lawyers who are representing Marvel Comics, Marvel Interests, Marvel Entities. There's a Stan Lee lawyer or two, and there is one lawyer representing the Kirbys in this uh, David vs. Goliath fight against a giant corporation with licensed properties worth in the multi-billions of dollars, probably. I mean, Deadpool did a, mil a billion dollars that one year. Uh, so uh, Jimmy plays Stan Lee, uh, Stan Lee's answers. I play the voice of everybody else. And if you're good, Jimmy, I'm good to go. Yeah, let's dive in. Where we left off, it was about an hour, and you can imagine that old Stan Lee, who's about 84 years old, could use an hour break, and, you know, after an hour of talking, give the guy a break. You can't be running these guys ragged because then they might start giving some real crazy answers. <laughs> after an hour, uh, they take their powder. The videographer says back on at 10.38 a.m. And Mr. Quinn, lawyer from Marvel, I believe, says we are discussing a number of different items generally about the process that you oversaw as editor back in the 50s and 60s. And I want to focus specifically on issues relating to Jack Kirby. You're aware that this is a dispute with the Kirby heirs? Nods head up and down <laughs> as an answer. Uh, you've got to say yes on the record. Yes. When did you first meet Jack Kirby? Well, the first day that I came to work at Timely Comics, which was either 39 or 40. And over the course of the years, what was your relationship with Mr. Kirby? Well, on my part, it was very cordial. I was a big fan of his from the beginning. Now, I'm going to focus on the period of time at issue in the 50s and late 50s and early 60s. At what point in time did Mr. Kirby come back to Marvel or Timely? I don't remember the year, but there was a time that he left and he did some work for DC Comics and then he came back, yes? And by the late 1950s, he had returned. The late 1950s, 60s. Let me rephrase the question. By 1960, he was back working at Marvel in that general area. Maybe he left two times. Maybe he left in the 50s, and that's what you're referring to. He was back by 60. Right. That may be, because I know there was a time later in the 60s that he left, and he came back, I think. Now, focusing on the period when he was at Marvel in the 60s, what was Jack Kirby's role at Marvel? The same as it had always... Wait a minute, did you say in the 50s? No, focusing on the 60s. As far as I know, the same as it had always been. He was our top artist, and I gave him what I thought were our most important projects. And what was what were his job responsibilities as an artist? Well, to draw the strip as well and as excited, excitingly and grippingly as possible, and draw it in such a way that the readers would want to see more, more, more. And who had the right to direct and supervise Mr. Kirby's work? That was me. And who had the ability to edit and control Mr. Kirby's work? That was my job. And who decided which comic books and characters Kirby would draw? I did. And who gave him those assignments? I did. As best you can recall, 
Did Mr. Kirby ever submit work to you or to Marvel that he had done on spec? Not that I remember. And you mentioned the situation uh, with taking him off of the Spider-Man book. In addition to that, were there other instances where you did edit Kirby's work? Well, I edited everybody's work. I don't remember taking him off anything else. Do you remember Mr. Kirby ever refusing to make any of the edits or changes that you made? As a matter of fact, no. Jack was really great to work with. To your knowledge, during this period in the 1960s, was Kirby working only for Marvel or was he doing work for other, publish other comic books? I thought he was working just for us. Now, typically, what was the work product after you had given Kirby an assignment? What was the work product that you would receive back from Kirby? I would receive back usually, if the book was pages long, I'd receive back beautifully drawn pages in pencil which told a story. And did Mr. Kirby ever suggest dialogue? Not orally, but what he would do when I would give Jack a rough idea for what the story should be, and he went home and he drew it in his own way, laying it out the way he thought would be best. He would put in the borders, the margins of the pages, he would put little notes letting so I would understand what he was getting at with each drawing. And he would sometimes put dialogue suggestions also. He better have said that, man. We would have pulled out some fucking exhibits of uh, artist editions. Let me show you what I'm going to mark as I believe it's Lee 5, uh, a magazine entitled Jack Kirby Collection 54. And I just want to point you to some portions of that, Re the reporter. Do you want me to put the sticker actually on it, Mr. Quinn? Yeah, you can put it on, Mr. Toberoff. Can I have a copy, please, Mr. Quinn? I'm sorry. Probably hands it, Mr. Toberoff. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. We tagged a particular section that has a little blue tag on it. You can open that. See the little? Oh, yes. And it's page 59 of this exhibit. And on the top, it talks about being fantastic penciling and the size, whatever that means. It says, what would a Lee and Kirby issue be without the Fantastic Four being heavily represented? And then it has a representation, I guess, of the penciling or the drawing done by Kirby in the first instance. Do you recognize the notes around the page? Well, that's Jack's handwriting. That's the way he wrote them, yes. And could you tell us, for example, in this instance, I see there's a dialogue that's actually in the different blocks. Tell us who did that dialogue. How was that process done? Well, I wrote the dialogue in the captions, but Jack would give me notes. For example, in panel of that page, the next to the last panel, right. Jack wrote what he suggested the dialogue might be. Quote, I will rule, my years underground will end, end quote. That was to let me know what he felt the fellow should be doing or saying. So I wrote, quote, my, co my conquest will be complete. I, the mole man, banished from my fellow men half a lifetime ago, will return at last as master of the earth, end quote. Very often I would write dialogue to fill up spaces. In other words, I also indicated where the dialogue balloons and the caption should go on the artwork. And I might not have written so much if he had made the face bigger, but inasmuch as there was that space on the upper right-hand part of the page, I put in more dialogue to sort of dress up the, balance the panel with picture and dialogue. That was something else I had mentioned, but I concentrated very much on. For example, in the panel above it, that panel was an interesting panel, and I didn't want to, I only used three lines of caption. I didn't want to crowd that with copy. And the same with the first panel. There's so much going on that I only had a two-line caption that only went part way across because I wanted the reader to enjoy looking at Jack's artwork with no interference. And who was it who decided where those, where the dialogue would go? I did. I always made the indications for the letter before giving my strips to a letter. I always indicated in pencil after I typed out the dialogue where the dialogue should go in the panel and the sound effects also. And this was the typical way that you would work with Mr. Kirby? With all the artists, yeah. And who had the final say with regard to what was going to be written in those panels? Well, I was the editor. I did. So just looking at some of the panels, who... Let's go to the next page up on top, top in the second panel. Mm -hmm. Read me what Kirby had written in. Let me see if I can make it out. Quote, as it leaves his hands, the staff's power blows and rocks um, something back. I can't make out the word. Right. And what did you substitute for this? Well, I thought it was so self 
explanatory, and design-wise I felt a big sound effect would be good, so I lettered in the word Batum, phonetic, for the letterer. I did it in pencil so the letterer would follow it, and I tried to make it part of the design of the panel. Was that something that you typically did? Let's look at another, the next page. The next page? I'm sorry, two pages over, which would be 62. I see in the third panel. Yeah. There is Shaboom. Right. Is that work uh, that you did? Absolutely. In fact, we used to have fun with it. Sometimes I remember there was one story where I did a sound effect, like with the three O's in it, and on the bottom I wrote a little caption saying something like, as every Marvel fan would know, the third O is silent. <laughs> the kids used to get kicks out of those kinds of things. I didn't do it in this one because this was too dramatic. Let me also mark as this would be Lee Six, a document that the cover says Fantastic Four. Mm -hmm. August, and it says 15 cents. Those were the days, back in the day. Started out at a dime. And, and looking, we've also clipped one of the panels. Actually, the panel, it's the same as in the drawing. There's a, there'll be a blue thing there, yeah? Oh, the blue thing, sorry. Go to that page and then take a look, uh, compare. Is that the same page that in Lee, in its final version, that is in? Oh, it seems to be, yes. With the same dialogue that you wrote in? Mm-hmm. So this would be this? Yeah. Stan? This is the way it looked printed. This is the way it came out to the public. Right. That now includes the work of the anchors and the colorists and all the other folks. And the letterer. And the letterer. Now, as part of the way you worked with Mr. Kirby and the assignments that you gave, did you ever ask Mr. Kirby to create new characters, or did he ever create new characters in the context of the work and the assignment you gave him? Well, he in the context of the work, I would give him the outline for the story. I might add that as we went on and we had been working together for years, the outlines I gave him were skimpier and skimpier. I may say something like, in this story, let's have Dr. Doom kidnap Sue Storm and the Fantastic Four has to go out and rescue them. And in the end, Dr. Doom does this and that. And that might have been all I would tell him for a 20-page story. Dr. Doom? Dr. Doom being the villain. The villain. And Jack would just put in all the details and everything. And then it was, I enjoyed that. It was like doing a crossword puzzle. I get the panels back and I have to put in the dialogue and make it all tie together. So we worked well together that way for years. But I'm sorry, I forgot what your question was. No, no, no. Uh, whether during that time that period of time, uh, was it part of his job to create new characters from time to time? Oh, that's why I mentioned. Mr. Toberoff, which I believe is uh, Kirby's guy, mm -hmm. assumes facts. Go ahead. Question from Mr. Quinn. Go ahead. That's why I mentioned that, because I might give him a very skimpy outline, like let Dr. Doom kidnap Sue. Now, when he drew the strip, he might introduce a lot of characters that he came up with in the story, he might have decided to have Dr. Doom send some giant robot to get Sue Storm, and he would make up the robot, or there might be some other people. Sure, Jack would often introduce a lot of new characters in the stories. And that was part of what his assignment was? Yeah. And did other artists do the same thing? Yes. To your recollection, were there any characters that Kirby created before he was working with you or anyone at Marvel that he brought to Marvel and then were published by Marvel? No, I don't believe so. I, I don't recall any. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Captain America, for God's sake. He and Joe Simon had created Captain America. Right. Now, by the time in the 60s Jack came to work for us, we weren't. there was no more Captain America. We weren't publishing it because Martin Goodman thought it was just a World War II character and people wouldn't be interested in it anymore. I always loved the character, so I decided to bring it back, and I tried to write a story where he had been frozen in a glacier for years and they found him, and he came back to life, and so forth. And I tried to give him some personality where he always felt he was an anachronism. He was living in our day, but yet he had the values of uh, 30 years ago, and I tried to make him a little bit interesting. And Jack would draw him, and Jack just drew him so beautifully, and the stories worked out so well that he became part of the Marvel superhero characters, the one that I did not create. Uh, yeah, and he's a great character, and they'll be making movies of him soon the one that I did not create. Question. Uh, other than Captain America, you can't remember any? No, I don't remember any others. To your knowledge, did Mr. Kirby ever shop a character around to other publishers before bringing it to Marvel? Not that I know of. Did you ever have any discussions with Mr. Kirby as to who owned the rights to particular characters? No, again, not that I can recall. 
Was it your understanding that Mr. Kirby was aware of Marvel's policies, that everything was work for hire? I took it for granted. We had never discussed it. Kirby's lawyer. Did you hear my objection? The reporter. No, I didn't. Sorry. Mr. Toboroff, uh, the Kirby lawyer, says leading. The reporter says thank you. Quinn, the Marvel representative, uh, to your knowledge, did Mr. Kirby ever try to use a storyline or a character that he and you created together from Marvel when he left Marvel and went to DC or someplace else? Did he take any stories we had done and use? Uh, not that I know of. Now we talked generally about how the freelancers were paid. How was Mr. Kirby paid? When he brought in, like everybody else, when he'd bring in his artwork, he'd hand in a voucher. We had pre, you know, pre prepared voucher forms and I would of course okay the voucher and it would go to the bookkeeping department based on the number of pages yeah so much per page to your knowledge did Mr. Kirby ever receive any royalties from Marvel did he receive royalties royalties from Marvel I don't know now you indicated that Kirby had left and come back to Marvel at several different periods of time to your knowledge when Mr. Kirby was working for other comic book publishers did he do some of his own writing I think so. I didn't really follow it, but I think when he worked for DC that he may have written some of the characters he created, but I don't know for sure. Do you know whether after he left Marvel, he had his characters had the same kind of success that the characters that came about during the period of time he was at Marvel? Well, I don't think they became as successful as the Marvel heroes, no. I want to focus specifically on the creation of a number of the specific characters that we talked about several, uh, but I want to go into them in a little bit of detail and let's start with the Fantastic Four you actually referenced them earlier tell me to the best you can recall how the idea for the Fantastic Four came about who they were and what was the backstory with regard to Fantastic Four time to pay some bills you want to support cartoonist kayfabe buy our books we're both working cartoonists the best way you can support cartoonist kayfabe is hit your local comic shops or wherever you buy books and pick up our latest titles starting with Ed Piscor's Red Room the anti-social network out now, available wherever books are sold, and the perfect thing to start reading before Trigger Warning starts in March. This will be available March 9th. Trigger Warnings in comic shops across this, uh, ac across the Blue Marble. And uh, if you love Outlaw Comics, if you like horror comics, violent comics, this is your Outlaw Comic for 2022. And Trigger Warnings, due to some ransomware attacks on a distribution level, may be the most rare of all the Red Room comics. So whenever you see this comic book in your local comic shop, Pick it up right away because it may not be there the next time you come in. And there are a few alternative covers that are available, including this gem from Peach Momoko. Not just a uh, institute cottage industry, but also a uh, friend of Cartoonist Kayfabe That's with, with quite right. a few of these. Uh, this is my contribution to the Red Room Trigger Warning cover for number one, an homage to the Zap Comics Robert Crumb famous issue. Uh, the fourth cover by Ed Piscor for Red Room Trigger Warnings number one. And those, again, will be in stores March 9th. And you can get Anti-Social Network right now. March is Cartoonist Kayfabe Month in the comic shops, Jimmy. Indeed it is. March 16th, you can pick up Hulk Grand Design Monster. This is my next comic available wherever comics are sold from Marvel Comics. Retelling the first 40 issues and approximately 500 issues of Incredible Hulk. Whether you're a longtime Hulk fan or a first-time reader, this is the book for you. And there are some great variety of covers for this as well, including Peach Momoko's Hulk Grand Design cover, Marcos Martin doing a really good transformation of the Hulk. Kind of kind of jealous of all of these, to be honest with you, which is the mark of a good cover. And, of course, cartoonist Kayfabe's own Ed Piscor doing the Todd McFarlane homage with the throwback Herb Trimpey Wolverine classic costume. And, again, these are available in comic book shops March 16th. So mark your calendar, tell your comic shop to reserve this, and pre-order Hulk Grand Design Madness, which will be out in April, and uh, those pre-orders can start coming in now. So back to our regular programming. Well, as I mentioned, Martin Goodman asked me to create a group of heroes because he found out that National Comics had a group that was selling well. So I went home and I thought about it, and I wanted to make these different than the average comic book heroes. I didn't want them to have a, uh, a secret identity, and I wanted to make it as realistic as possible. Instead of them living in Gotham City or Metropolis, I felt I will have them live in New York City. And instead of the obligatory teenager Johnny Storm driving a whiz-bang V8, he would drive a Chevy Corvette. I wanted everything real, and I wanted their relationships to be real. Instead of a girl who didn't know that the hero was really a superhero, 
Not only did she know who he was, but they were engaged to be married, and she also had a superpower. So, you know, things like that. And I thought I would try that. So I wrote up a very brief synopsis about that, and naturally I called Jack because he was our best artist, and I asked him if he would do it. He seemed to like the idea, took the synopsis, and he drew the story and put in his own touches, which were brilliant, and it worked out beautifully. Books sold, and that was the start of the Marvel success, you might say. And tell me or tell us all your thinking in the creating the four different characters, Mr. Fantastic, the Invisible Woman, the Human Torch, and the Thing, Kirby's Lawyer. Assume facts. I'm sorry? You can answer. Tell you what? Tell us what was your thinking with regard to or the idea behind these specific four characters. Well, I wanted them to be a team, but I wanted them to act like real people, so they didn't always get along well. I wanted one of them to be, we called him the thing, to be kind of a very powerful, ugly guy who would be pathetic because they all got their superpowers by being in a spaceship that was hit by cosmic rays. And Mr. Fantastic got the ability to stretch his limbs. The girl Sue Storm had the ability to become invisible and surround herself with the force field. And the boy Johnny Storm, her brother, was able to burst into flame and fly. I took that from an old Marvel book, one of Timely Comics' first books called The Human Torch. I always loved that character who had been an android, a robot or something, but I felt I'm going to give Johnny Storm that power. He can fly and burst into flame. So we had a guy who can stretch, a girl who could be invisible, a man who was an ugly monster, and again, to go against type, I thought I'd make the ugly monster kind of a funny guy. He's pathetic, but he's also the comedy relief, and he was always arguing and fighting with the Human Torch, who was always trying to give him a hot foot, and he was always trying to grab him and throttle him. They all loved each other, but they never got along well. The more they fought amongst themselves, the more the readers loved it, and that was the way I envisioned it. Now, I'm going to mark as Lee, I believe it's number seven, the next exhibit. There's no little blue thing. I'll get you there. It's a document that's actually a magazine entitled Alter Ego, the comic book artist collection. Are you familiar with Alter Ego? Oh, yes. It's a well-known fanzine. And is a man by the name of Roy Thomas mm -hmm. that is, I guess, involved in publishing Alter Ego. Right. Tell us who Mr. Thomas is. Well, Roy Thomas is somebody that I met years ago. He came up to the office for a job as a writer, and unlike a lot of comic book writers, he had been an English teacher in school. Even though he was a fan, that sort of set him a little above the others. And I hired him, and he began to write a lot of our stories. And then when I left to become the publisher, I appointed him as editor-in-chief to replace me. And that would, that would have been somewhere around 1968? I guess. And let me call your attention to an article that starts on page 32 of Stan Lee 7. And specifically, this is an article entitled, A Fantastic First, authored by Roy Thomas. Are you familiar with this article? I read it years ago. And specifically, it's a discussion about the creation of Fantastic Four. And do you recall when you read it, did you see anything that was wrong or incorrect in the article? I guess not, no. There's a reaction of a note in the article that reads, and it says, Hi, Roy, quote, Hi, Roy, I found the FF number one synopsis, end quote. Oh, he must have been asking me if I could ever get it for him. And then you go on, and that's your handwritten note? That's your signature? Oh, yes. And you recall generally sending him this note? Yes. And it goes on to say, uh, we'll mail it off to you on Monday. It's not clear enough to fax. Then it says, sorry to say I have uh, no other synopsis on file. Never, never thought to save any. To this day, I will never uh, know what made me save Fantastic Four numbers synopsis. I certainly never thought anyone would care about it later on. And then across the other page, there is a document, a, recre a recreation of a document that says synopsis for Fantastic Four July 61 number one right and then it says story number one introduction meet the Fantastic Four is that the synopsis that you wrote back in 61 this is the original synopsis that I wrote and I gave it to Jack and of course after that we discussed it and we embellished it and we made little changes but this was the beginning of it yeah you mentioned in your note to Mr. Thomas that you hadn't saved others because you didn't think anyone would ever did you create other synopsises from time to time? Oh, yeah. In the article on the first page, and I will just read it to you, it says, Mr. Thomas writes, quote, Actually, this wasn't the first early 60s synopsis of Stan's I'd seen, end quote. And it says, quote, uh, See later part of the article. 
And when I had gone to work with him in July 1965, I'd learned that he was increasingly dispensing with written synopsises with Marvel artists, often working merely from brief conversations in person or over the phone, end quote. That's right. And he's referring to what you previously testified, how the Marvel method came about. Yes. And you see also these artists were so good and I had worked with them for so long that I knew what I could expect from them. And I think they knew what I expected and what I meant when I would give them a few words explaining a story. It's like two comedians who had been a team on stage for a long time and they could anticipate what each other was going to say. That I couldn't have done this with an artist I just met, you know, that I had never worked with, but I had worked with these people for so long, we knew each other and we could work where I'd give them a few words and they could go ahead and come up with the written drawn story. They would know what you wanted? Right. And if they did anything a little different, it was usually an improvement, and I would change the dialogue to suit what they had done. Kirby's lawyer. I'm sorry, since I don't have the entire exhibit in front of me, just the article, I'd like to know the date of this magazine this appeared in and issue number. Uh, Marvel lawyer. Yeah, hold on one second. I can tell you that. I think it's Kirby's lawyer. Uh, if I could just look at Stan's Marvel lawyer, I will tell you. It's volume two, number two, the summer of 1998. Kirby's lawyer says, thanks. And then the Marvel guy says, uh, now looking at, let's turn the page over to page 34. And I'm going to read a portion of this article that's quoting you. Mr. Thomas writes, quote, in answer to my earlier query, Stan sent a few comics along with the synopsis, end quote. And then he quotes you, quote, uh, incidentally, I didn't discuss it with Jack first, referring to the synopsis. Uh, I wrote I wrote it first after telling Jack it was for him because I knew he was the best guy to draw it, end quote. And you go on, quote, P.S. As you are probably aware, the biggest change was that that was made after the synopsis was written was I decided to make the thing more sympathetic than originally intended, end quote. Right. After giving, quote, after seeing the way Jack drew him, I felt it was too obvious for such an ugly, monstrous-looking guy to act in a typically monstrous, menacing way, end quote. Do you recall s sending this note to Mr. Thomas? Yes. And what were you referring to? Well, I was referring to what I mentioned before. I would very often give a writer a synopsis or an oral synopsis what I wanted, and then later, when the story was penciled, I would look at it and say, well, maybe we should change this or maybe make this character a little more that way. And as I mentioned with the thing, when I saw the way he looked, I thought it would be dull. We got a guy who looks like a monster. If he just acts like a monster, a dumb monster, it would be more interesting to give him a real personality. And actually the guy, some of you were too young to know him, but I thought of Jimmy Durante, an old comedian. Sadly, I'm not too young to know him. <laughs> I tried to have the thing talk a little like Jimmy Durante after that kind of an explosive personality. So... The article on the next page, there's several numbered paragraphs, and number five talks about, and I will just read it into the record, uh, regarding the idea, I think this is the part, it's not a quote, so, regarding the idea of Sue remaining permanently invisible and having to wear a humanoid face mask to be seen, well, Stan's note at the end of the paragraph indicates that he is already rethinking that bit. He asked Jack to talk with him about it because, quote, Maybe we'll change this gimmick somewhat, end quote. Since the writer, editor, and artist probably discussed this point before, Jack started drawing any, any number of other changes, including the notion of starting with a multi-page action sequence may have been suggested then as well as, as well by either man. In any event, Sue gained control of her invisibility almost at once. That's right. What, you were, what were you referring to there? Well, I think either Jack or I, or both of us, I don't know, must have thought at some point that she'd always be invisible and she'd have to wear a mask or something so people would see her. Right. And whether it was my idea or not, as I thought about it, I thought, that's a lousy idea. So we decided to change it where she could look like a normal person and make herself invisible at will or make herself normal at will. And who in this process had the ultimate decision to decide how that was going to come about? Well, I did. I was the editor. And turning over to the next page of the article, up on the actually, the crossover, page 37, there's another document that's recreated that says, Synopsis for Fantastic, Synopsis for Fantastic Four number, number 8, Prisoners of the Puppet Master. 
Do you recognize that as another of the synopsises that you created in connection with the Fantastic Four? I hadn't read that for so many years, but yeah, that seems to be mine. I didn't even know that this was in here. Wow, yeah. See, instead of telling him page by page, I would say, devote five pages to this, five pages to that, three pages to that. Yeah. That was typical of how you were wor working utilizing the Marvel method? Yeah, sometimes I wouldn't even be this specific, and I wouldn't have cared if Jack devoted, let's say, six pages to this, and he changed that to three pages, just so he got the idea of what I had in mind, but he was good at making his own changes and very often improved them. But yeah, this is mine. Let's go to another character, the Silver Surfer. Oh, yeah. Could you tell us how the Silver Surfer came about? Right. I wanted to have a villain called Galactus. We had so many villains who were so powerful. I was looking for somebody who would be more powerful than any, so I figured somebody who is a demigod who rides around in space and destroys planets. I told Jack about it and told him how I wanted the story to go generally, and Jack went home and he drew it, and he drew a wonderful version. But when I looked at the artwork, I saw there was some nutty-looking naked guy on a flying surfboard. And I said, who is this? And he said, well, I don't remember whether he called him the surfer or not. He may have called him the surfer, but he said, I thought that anybody as powerful as Galactus who could destroy planets should have somebody who goes ahead of him, a herald, who finds the planets for him. And I thought it would be good to have that guy on a flying surfboard. I said, One, that's wonderful. I loved it, and I decided to call him the Silver Surfer, which I thought sounded dramatic. But that was all. He was supposed to be a herald to find Galactus's planets, but the way Jack drew him, he looked so noble and so interesting that I said, Jack, you know we ought to really use this guy. I like him. And I tried to write his copy so that he was very philosophical, and he was always co commenting about the state of the world, and don't you human beings realize you live in a paradise? Why don't you appreciate it? Why do you fight each other and hate each other? And I had him talking like that all the time, and the college kids started to love him. And whenever I would lecture at a college and there was a question and answers period, it was inevitably the silver surfer that they would talk about the most, so I was very happy with him. And that's how it happened accidentally. I mean, I had nothing. I, I didn't think of him. Jack, it was one of the characters Jack tossed into the strip, and he drew him so beautifully that I felt we have to make him an important character. And this is, you talked about it before, that artists were expected as part of their job to populate the story with characters. Kirby's lawyer, misstates testimony. The question from Marvel, you can answer. Pardon me? You can answer. Oh, you see, if there's a story where the hero goes, let's say, to a nightclub, so I would say, or whoever the writer is would say, the hero goes to a nightclub, and he talks to this person, and then there's a gunfight, well, when the artist draws it, the artist has to draw other people in the nightclub. So the artist is always creating new characters. I mean, the artist might decide to have the character standing at the bar and draw a sexy-looking bartender, a female or an interesting-looking bartender. The artist in every strip always creates new characters to flesh out the strip and to make the characters living in the real world, sure. Who is it up to? Who had the last word as to whether or not a particular character would make it into the final publication? Well, I guess I did, and my publisher, Martin, who might also look at a character and say, I like him, let's see more of him, although he didn't do it that often. Did he ever say I didn't like it? Yeah. A particular character? Yeah, mostly in westerns. He was big on our western books, and sometimes he wouldn't like the way a character was drawn. Let's talk a little bit about Spider-Man. How did the idea for Spider-Man come about? Again, I was looking for... Martin said, we're doing pretty good, let's get some more characters. So I was trying to think of something different, and I have always hated teenage sidekicks so i thought it would be fun to do a teenager who isn't a sidekick but who is the real hero so that part was easy but then you had to the toughest thing is dreaming up a superpower so i thought what superpower can i give him and it finally occurred to me a guy who could stick to walls like an insect crawl on a wall and stick to a ceiling i didn't recall ever having seen any character like that before so i thought that's what i'll do i'm going to get a teenager who can crawl on walls but the second most important thing is a title. Titles are very, the names of the characters are very important. So I went down the list. Could I call him Mosquito Man, Insect Man, Fly Man, and I got to Spider Man. It sounded dramatic and I remember I had read a pulp magazine when I was a kid called Spider Man. The guy didn't have a superpower, he was just a guy who went around fighting bad guys, but I thought Spider Man sounds great. And again, I went to Jack. I think I told you this before, but. It's okay. I went to Jack and asked him to draw it 
and he did, but he didn't make the teenager look as wimpy or as nerdy as I thought he should, and I realized that really isn't Jack's style. Jack mostly draws glamorous, heroic Captain America type. Not that he couldn't have, but he would have had to force himself. So I figured I will get somebody that it comes easy to. And nobody, Jack, nor I, nor anybody, thought that Spider-Man was going to be a big strip, so it didn't matter. So I said, forget it, Jack. I will give it to someone else. He said, okay, and he went back to Fantastic Four or Thor or whatever he was drawing, and I gave it to Steve Ditko. And Steve had that kind of awkward feeling. It was just right for Spider-Man. So I gave it to Steve, and that's what happened. Now, did you discuss the idea that you had for Spider-Man with Mr. Goodman? Oh, yeah. He hated it. Tell us about that. Want that story? Yeah, sure. Hope I'm not boring you all. Not at all. I had the idea for Spider-Man, so I went in and I told him. I said, I want him to be a teenager. I want him to be called Spider-Man, and I want him to have a lot of personal... I didn't mention that I wanted him to have a lot of personal problems because I thought that would make him very empathetic to the reader, uh, teenage readers. And today is what we call... <laughs> and today is what we call them issues. He'd have issues. That's, Part, a, that's a weird sentence, huh? It is a weird sentence. Uh, pardon me? He'd have issues. Right. This lawyer's draw. Well, I better not say that. <laughs> that guy will sue us. Personal issues. That's right. And I told that to Martin Goodman. And Martin said... Stan, you're losing it. That's the worst idea I ever heard. He said, first of all, you can't call a hero Spider-Man. People hate spiders. Secondly, you can't make him a teenager. Teenagers can be sidekicks. And finally, problems? Don't you know what a superhero is? They don't have problems. They're superheroes. So I had a feeling I hadn't hit pay dirt with that one as far as Martin was concerned, but I always liked the idea. So sometime later, we had a magazine we were going to drop. It was called Amazing Fantasy. Strange it strangely enough steve ditko had drawn all the stories in that one now that i remember anyway it wasn't selling well and we were going to drop it now when you drop a magazine nobody cares what you put in the last issue because you're dropping it anyway so just to get it out of my system that's when i asked jack to draw it then i asked steve to draw it and we did a little i don't know 10 or 12 page story and we threw it in amazing fantasy in the last issue and just for fun i put him on the cover and the book sold fantastically so a couple months later, when the sales figures were in, Martin came to me and he said, Hey Stan, you remember that Spider-Man idea of yours that we both liked so much? Why don't we make a series of it? And I will never forget that. Conjecture piece. Uh, if you look at Amazing Fantasy 15, there's editorial stuff in there stating that that character was going to get his own book anyhow. So that this you know is a little bit muddled. It's inevitable you tell these stories and you tell them thousands of times sure. like imagine how many times stanley talked about the spider-man story and that the publisher didn't believe in it and he put it in the in a canceled book yeah you know it feels like that'd be a story that he'd tell over and over at these colleges and places i would think totally because it's sound it's so polished in this telling yeah of course yeah like all, all of his origin stories are he shines there uh but uh when when we looked at amazing fantasy 15 story and i like mentioned it uh one of the thoughts was did these guys realize that they had something ama amazing? No, no, no pun <laughs> sure. intended. Because they seem to go all in on it right then, and there is no money coming back. So you see this costume, you set this thing up. Is there an electric charge in the air that it's like, you know what? Let's 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 float this one time. It's so bizarre. And now you add in like Eric Stanton as a studio mate with, with spider, uh, you know, fishnet stockings on his characters yeah. next to Steve Ditko, and it becomes even more strange. The other note, while we're in this little conjecture period, pulling out alter egos and Kirby collectors. Yeah. It's so surreal to this read these things. Material, like, dude. It's, it's so bizarre. Like, this is a trial. <laughs> or, well, not a trial, but, you know, I mean, this is a legal proceeding, and, and this is what you're doing. It's, it's interesting in that we talk about fans keeping comics history alive, and I mean, literally, like they're pulling out fanzines to, you know, to bring into this deposition as a record. Right. Pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. So there's a little bit of kerfuffle here where they got to change the tape for the videographer. And we'll just jump right back into uh, Mr. Quinn saying, just for the record, I want to note that Marvel is going to designate the deposition transcript confidential pursuant to the protective order when it's signed. I guess we're operating now under an agreement. Uh, Kirby's lawyer says, well, we don't have a protective order in place and we're not accepting the protective order submitted by Marvel. We proposed a protective order, the same one we had in the Superman case. 
but I never heard back from anybody about it. That was nearly a week ago. Uh, Marvel guy says, uh, I'm sure we'll get back to you shortly, Mark. I promise. And then Kirby's guy says, okay. The Marvel guy says, in any event, let me go back to something you testified a little while ago when we were talking about the process of where artists sometimes create characters as part of the story. As you mentioned, for example, the possibility of an artist creating a lady bartender. Whose job or whose responsibility, uh, if it was decided that this was really an interesting character, who would be the one who would make the decision that that character, uh, to take that character and make him or her a separate character of a new comic? Well, either whoever is the editor or the publisher. So at this period of time, it would have been Mr. Goodman? At that period, it would have been me or, Ms. or Martin. So, for example, with regard to Silver Surfer, uh, who decided to essentially take the Silver Surfer and make him a separate character? Oh, me. And why? Why? Why did you decide to do that? Because I just thought he was such an interesting looking and such a unique character. We had never seen a guy on a flying surfboard who could travel from planet to planet. And it was you who gave him the name Silver Surfer? Yes. Okay. Now let's go to the Incredible Hulk. And, uh... Could you tell us the incredible? Can you tell us how the Incredible Hulk came about? What was your idea for him? Well, same thing. I was trying to. It was my job to come up with new characters and to expand the line as much as I could. So I was trying to think again. What can I do that's different? I liked the thing very much, and I thought, what if I got get somebody who is a real monster? And I remembered I had always in the old movie Frankenstein with Boris Karloff. I had always thought that that monster was the good guy because he didn't want to hurt anybody but those idiots with torches who were always chasing him up and down the hills he was a misunderstood monster a miss you said it better than i could have so i thought it would be fun to get a monster who is really good but nobody knows it and they fight him and then the more i thought about it i figured it could be dull after a while just having people chasing a monster and i remember dr jekyll and mr hyde i thought why not treat him like jekyll and hyde He's really a normal man who can't help turning into a monster, and it would make a very interesting story if when he needs his monstrous strength the most, the poor guy turns back into a normal man. I could get a lot of story complications, so I thought that would be good. I needed a name. Years ago, I remember there was a comic book called The Heap, H-E-A-P. I don't remember even what he was, but I always thought that was some real crazy name. And somehow or other, I thought I will call him The Hulk. It's a little like The Heap. And it has that same feeling, but I love adjectives like the Fantastic Four, the Uncanny So-and-So. So I decided I'll call him the Incredible Hulk, and that's what happened. Conjecture? Was the adjective Hulk like a hulking monster? Like, did that exist before the Hulk? Because he's talking about it like it's like he's just <clears throat> stringing words together. I'll call him Hulk. Yeah, it's, it's kind of strange. There was a monster in the like the 50s Marvel comics that was the hulk mm. so you know like he's not plucking that name out of nowhere that was a name marvel had used and, and in fact i think hulk annual number 11 they bring back a bunch of the monsters for uh you know kind of the the showdown but hulk is kind of the evolution and i think there might be a couple other characters at marvel that did that where it was like there was some name and then they did like a more modern or you know kept the name but changed the character here's the important question of the deposition and how come the hulk is green that's a long story. When I did the Fantastic Four, we started getting a lot of fan mail, and the fan, remember I told you I didn't want them to have costumes, and the fan mail said, we love the book, it's great, oh, it's the best new thing we've seen, but if you don't give them costumes, we'll never buy another issue. And I realized there's something unique about the comic book reader. <laughs> they love the superhero fan. They love costumes. Well, I couldn't figure out a way to give a monster a costume. I couldn't see a monster, the Hulk, walking into a costume store or making one for himself. So I figured I'll do the next best thing. I'll give him a different skin color. That will always look like a costume. You may not know this, but originally I made him gray. I thought that a gray skin would look spooky and scary and dramatic. But when the book was published, the printer apparently had a problem with the color gray. On one page, he was light gray. On one page, dark gray. On one page, black. On one page, almost white. I said this will never do, so I decided on another color. See, you can do that when you're a comic book editor. You can do anything. So I will change the color of his skin. So I looked around for a color that wasn't being used. I couldn't think of any green hero. I said, I will make him green. And it turned out to be a good choice because I was able to come up with little sayings like the jolly green giant or the green Goliath and so forth. And that's how it happened. 
I could have thought of pink or blue or any other color. Now, after you came up with the character, who did you ask to draw the character? My best guy, Jack Kirby. And do you remember giving Kirby directions as to what you wanted with regard to what he was to draw? I remember the first thing I said to him. I said, Jack, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I want you to draw a sympathetic monster, and he came up with the Hulk. And did you, as part of that direction, give him a backstory and storyline? Oh, yeah. We had to figure out how the Hulk would be, how he came to be the Hulk. So I decided he's a scientist named Bruce Banner, and I'm not very scientific. All I know are the name of things. I don't really know how they work or anything, but I had used cosmic rays for the Fantastic Four to get them powers, so I heard the expression gamma ray somewhere. So I said, let's let Bruce Banner be subjected to a gamma ray, and that turns him into the Hulk. But it had to be in a heroic way. So I said, let's get a teenage. They're doing a test for a new kind of gamma ray bomb somewhere. The military is doing that. And some idiot teenager is riding his bike past the no trespassing sign onto the test area. And Bruce Banner in his cubicle sees the kid and he runs out to save the kid. Say, get out of here. There's going to be a gamma ray explosion. But Bruce Banner had a rival scientist who was jealous of him. And when the scientist sees Bruce Banner run out, he says, quick, start the explosion. And the gamma ray explodes, and Bruce throws himself on top of the kid to save the kid, and he gets subjected to the gamma ray. That's how he becomes the Hulk, and that's how we know he's really a hero at heart. And how do you say this uh, under, like, sworn testament? <laughs> <laughs> and in creating and then coming up with the backstory, did you, Kirby's lawyer, assume facts not in evidence, Marvel's lawyer, as the Hulk progressed, did you follow the same process that you previously testified to in terms of how you directed and edited the Hulk stories? Yeah, well, I told Jack essentially what I told you, and he just drew it anyway, you know, the, the best way he could, and it turned out great. Let's talk a little. Let's talk about Iron Man. Tell us how Iron Man came about, how he was created, the backstory with regard to Iron Man. I would try to make it shorter. It was the same type of thing. I was looking for somebody new, and I thought, I don't know why I thought it, somebody in a suit of armor. And what if it was iron armor? He would be so powerful. So for some reason, I have always been fascinated by Howard Hughes. I thought it would, I would get a hero like Howard Hughes. He's an inventor, he's a mil multimillionaire, he's good looking, he likes the women. And, but I got to make something tragic about him. And then it occurred to me if he, somehow when he got his armor, it's a long story, but he gets into a fight and he gets injured in his chest and his heart is injured and he has to wear this little thing that runs the iron armor. He has to wear that on his chest because it keeps his heart beating and that would make him a tragic figure as well as the most powerful guy. So I thought the readers would like him even more with that little bit added to it. And that was it. Then again, oh, but wait a minute. This one wasn't Jack. I called Don Heck. And I asked Don Heck because I think Jack was busy with something else. That must have been what it was. Don Heck is another artist? He's another artist that we had who was pretty good. And he drew the first Iron Man. I think I might have given the cover to Jack to do. I don't remember who did the cover. I, I think it might have been Jack. And in coming up with the backstory, did you include a love interest? Oh, yeah, I forgot. I made up a name called A Girl Who Worked for the Millionaire. I figured he has... I wanted him to be a playboy, so he has this gorgeous assistant secretary named Pepper Potts, and he's in love with her, and she's in love with him, but he won't admit he's in love with her because he figures he could die any minute with this bad heart, and he loves her too much to make her a widow, and so she never, admit, so he never admits to her how he feels about her, which again is a little touch of pathos for this series. He also has a friend named Happy Hogan, and it goes on and on. <laughs> Now, in addition to Don Heck, did your brother, Larry Lieber, have a role in Iron Man? Oh, yeah. I came up with the idea, but when the script uh, when the script was drawn, I didn't have time to put in the copy, so I asked my brother Larry to write it. And this happened on other occasions where? Yeah, there were times when I would ask Larry to write something. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk. Excuse me one second. I may have asked Larry to write it in script form and then give it to Don to draw. I'm not sure. I may have done that. Let's talk next about Thor. Mm-hmm and how Thor was created, and what was your idea behind Thor? Same thing. I was looking for something different and bigger than anything else, and I figured, what could be bigger than a god? Well, people were pretty much into the Roman and the Greek gods by then, and I thought the Norse gods might be good, and I liked the sound of the name Thor and Asgard and the Twilight of the Gods Ragnarok and all that. And Jack was very much into that, more so than me, so when I told Jack about that, he was really thrilled, 
and we got together and we did Thor the same way. And what was the idea behind Thor? What was his deal? I wanted him to be... Kirby's lawyer, excuse me, objection, vague and ambiguous. Uh, the Marvel lawyer says, you can answer. I wanted him to be the son of Odin, who is the king of the gods like Jupiter. And I wanted him to have an evil brother, Loki. And I just like the fantastic... And just like the Fantastic Four were always fighting Doctor Doom and Spider-Man was usually fighting the Green Goblin, I figured Loki would be the big villain. He's Thor's half-brother, he's jealous of Thor, he has enchantment powers, so in a way, he's a good foe. Thor has strength, but Loki is like a magician and can do all kind of things. So that seemed good to me. And then Thor had a girlfriend from Legend called Sif, S-I-F, and I would have her involved in the stories and have jealousy. And then I wanted some comedy relief, so it wasn't... I don't think it was until the strip had been going for a while, but I decided there were three guys. I called them the Warriors, but I wanted to include a very fat guy named Volstag, the voluminous Volstag, I called him, who acts like a real hero. Come on, let's go get them. But when the fights start, he's cowardly and always holds back. Another guy like Earl Flynn called Fandral the Dashing, and a guy like Charles Bronson in Death Wish... I think I called him Hogan the Grim. And the three of them, Fandral the, the Dashing, Hogan the Grim, and Volstag the Voluminous, I thought they could be Thor's friends and they would provide comedy relief. And I'm happy to see they're using them in the movie, I think. And it was something that we both enjoyed doing very much. And Jack was wonderful with the costumes that he gave them. I mean, nobody could have drawn costumes like he gave them. The character Thor, how did, what idea did you ha have to come up with his powers? Well, he had... What was the backstory? Kirby's lawyer assumes facts. Oh, yeah. He had mainly a hammer, an enchanted hammer. The backstory was I decided to make him a guy here on Earth, a doctor, uh, I forget his name. But whatever his name was, he was lame, and he walked with a cane. And for some reason, he went to Norway, and there he... I think the stone men from Saturn were somewhere. Some aliens who were stone men had landed in Norway, and they wanted to kill our doctor. And he rushes into a cave somewhere to hide from them. And they're coming toward him. But he sees a hammer in the ground and some kind of a sign that said, I don't remember the exact wording, but whoever is worthy would be able to lift this hammer. Sort of like the King Arthur legend. And he grabs the hammer and he's able to lift it up. And it seems that destiny had prepared that for him over the centuries. The minute it lifts up, he turns into the thunder god Thor. And wielding the hammer, he takes care of the stone men. And then he can always become... Dr. Don Blake, that was his name, I believe, Don Blake. If he hits the hammer on the ground, it turns back into the cane that he always had because he was lame. He walked with a cane as Don Blake, Dr. Don Blake. So he's a surgeon who walks with a cane, but when he hits the cane on the ground, he turns into the mighty Thor, God of Thunder. And that was the idea. You have a lot of doctors. Do you have any lawyers in this whole process? <laughs> Maybe next time, next go round. We do have a lawyer, Daredevil. Daredevil. Tell me about Daredevil. Yeah, same thing. Oh, by the way, I think Thor also was written by my brother. After I came up with the outline, I think Larry wrote the first script. Now, let me see. Daredevil. Daredevil. I want to hear about the lawyer. Again, I'm trying to think of what can I do that hasn't been done, and it occurred to me. Well, certainly, making a lawyer hero would fall into that category. Uh, but in any event, go ahead. Tell me about Daredevil. After this is over, I want to write... After this is over, I want him to write for us. I figured I will get a blind man and make him a hero. And how do you do that? So I said, what if all his other senses are very acute? What if he can hear so well that he can tell if you're lying to him because he hears your pulse rate speed up, your heartbeat. And he can smell so well he can tell if a girl has been in a room. He could smell her cologne even if it was two days ago. You know, you get your balance through your ears. So he's like an acrobat, like a circus tightrope walker. He can do anything any trained athlete can do and on and on. And I figured, that's kind of good. Oh, and he has a radar sense and a sonar sense. So when he's daredevil, nobody knows he's blind. He is like the greatest circus acrobat. However, he has a law office. His name was Murdoch, Matt Murdoch. And he had a friend named Foggy Nelson. For some reason, I called him Foggy. And they have a law firm called Nelson and Murdoch. And I have him fighting villains who weren't too super. He didn't fight monsters or anything. I tried to keep the strip a little more realistic. And I loved the character. And Jack was busy and Steve Ditko was busy. Everybody was busy. But there's an artist named Don Heck. 
not Don Heck, I'm sorry, named Bill Everett, who had done one of the first strips that Martin Goodman ever had when he started Timely Comics, and that was The Submariner. And Bill was still around, and I called Bill and I said, how would you like to draw Daredevil? And he said, oh, great. So I gave him what I told you, essentially, little more, because I forget who the villain was in the first story, but whatever it was, that's what I told him. And he drew it, and I put in the copy, and it's a shame Bill was ill or something. I don't know. He, he couldn't do too many strips. He did one or two, and then that was the end of it. Keeping with our discussion, could you tell us about the creation of X-Men? How did that come about? Again, Martin asked me for another team because the Fantastic Four had been doing well. And again, I wanted to try something different. And I thought, what? I could think of superpowers for them, but how do they get their powers? I have already had cosmic rays and gamma rays and bitten by a radioactive spider. What was left? So I took the cowardly way out. I said, I'm going to just say they were born that way. They're mutants. Now, I don't have to figure out gamma rays or anything. So I decided to have a group of young mutants. And I really, the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. I said, they'll go to a school. They have to keep their mutant power secret. So it will just say a school for gifted youngsters. Nobody will know it means mutants. And we'll get a professor who gets them together. And this guy should also have mutant powers, but I will make him have mental powers. He's got a brain. He can send thought waves all around, and he can send his thought waves around to detect where there's a kid with mutant powers, and then he'll ask that kid to enroll in his school. And again, so that he isn't too powerful, I thought I would make him in a wheelchair. He's the professor. And what was his name? Professor Xavier. And I thought of the character, and then I thought of the characters. There would be a girl who can do, called Marvel Girl, who could do crazy things, and a fella called the Beast, who looks a little bit ape-like, so to go against type, I made him the smartest and the most articulate of all of them. And a guy named the Angel with wings and so forth. And when I went to tell the idea to Martin Goodman, I said, he loved it, but I said, I want to call it the mutants. He said, that's a terrible name. Nobody knows what the word mutants means. So I went back and I thought about it and I thought Professor X, Professor, X, Professor Xavier, and the mutants have extra powers. For some reason, I thought I could call them the X-Men. So I went back to Martin. He said, oh, that's a good name. And as I walked out, I thought, if nobody knows what a mutant is, how are they going to know what an X-Man is? But I had my name, so I wasn't about to make waves. And you gave the this. Oh, yeah, luckily. Idea to Kirby? Luckily, Jack was free at the time. And again, he did a wonderful job. Did you, again with X-Men, uh, follow the same pattern you testified before using the Marvel method? Yeah, I spoke to him. I don't even think I wrote anything. I think we talked about it, and he was on absolutely the same wavelength. He saw it the way I did. So I said, go on and draw it, and he did, and it came out great. And I wrote the copy, and it became one of our best-selling strips. Next, Nick Fury. Tell us about Nick Fury. Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. There was a television series called The Man from U.N.C.L.E. that I used to watch, and I liked it. And I thought it would be fun to get something like that as a comic book. So I remembered we had done a war series called Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, stories of World War II, and it was quite popular. I don't really like war stories, so after a few years of doing it, I asked Martin if we could drop the book so we could concentrate on superheroes, and he said okay, but we got a lot of fan mail. The kids loved the characters, and we kept reprinting those books, and they sold as well as the originals. So when I wanted to do the thing like The Man from U.N.C.L.E., I thought, why don't I take that popular Sergeant Fury that was years ago in World War II, why don't I say he's older now and he's a colonel, and he's in charge of this new outfit that I made up, S.H.I.E.L.D., which stood for the Supreme Headquarters International Law Enforcement Division. So I took Sergeant Fury, who now has a patch over one eye, and made him in charge of this group, and again, there was Jack Kirby. I said, how would you like to draw Nick Fury, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D.? And it was right up Jack's alley. He loves that kind of stuff. And he came up with all kinds of weapons and things. And again, you had the same process of overseeing and editing it? Yeah, it was always the same process. Let's focus on the Avengers. How did, did the Avengers come about? Tell us who the Avengers are. Well, they're anybody that we wanted to put in the group of our own heroes. I don't even remember who they were in the first issue. It might have been Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Daredevil. I don't even rem remember because we kept changing the roster each month whoever we felt like. But the idea was that they were organized by, I don't remember which of our heroes organized. Oh, they got together and decided to become a fighting team. Again, we wanted something like the Justice League that DC had. 
Had you discussed the idea for The Avengers with Martin Goodman? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I couldn't do any book unless Martin approved it. And I remember Iron Man was the rich one. I had them use Iron Man's mansion on Fifth Avenue as the Avengers headquarters, and Captain America was definitely an Avenger. Iron Man and Spider-Man never joined them. Uh, he was a loner. But then I would have them... The toughest thing about the Avengers, they were all so powerful that we had to find powerful villains for them to fight. And again, you know, Jack drew it and it turned out to be popular. They're going to make a movie of that too. You needed to have very powerful villains to make it a fair fight. Oh, sure. In fact, it's always best if the villain, if it isn't a fair fight, if the villain seems even more powerful, because then you wonder, how will the hero ever get out of this one? And who came up with the backstory for the Avengers? There really wasn't much backstory. I did, but just the idea that they all get together and form a group, because I didn't have to create new characters. We had them. I just needed an excuse for them to get together. And honestly, I forget what the excuse was now. Let's talk a little bit uh, about one of my favorites, Ant-Man. Tell us a little bit about why you came up with and how you came up with Ant-Man. Kirby's lawyer assumes facts. Question. Who created Ant-Man? What could I do that was different? I don't know how... I don't know of any hero that was that big uh, indicating. I assume this. Right. <laughs> so I thought, I'll go for it. Martin okayed it. And I don't remember if Jack did the first one or not. Maybe he did or you wouldn't be mentioning it. You know, it was just, it was not all that successful, and I later realized why it wasn't that successful. The interesting thing about a character who is that big would be to show him against a lot of big things. But somehow, no matter which artist drew him, they always made him look life-size. They put him in the foreground so you didn't enjoy the contrast of this little guy next to big. You know, if they had him near a cigarette and an ashtray, but they always had him somehow where he didn't look like Ant-Man. Anyway, I hate to give it up. So at some point, I changed him to Giant Man. He had the ability to become a giant. The ant could become giant? Yeah, and that didn't become too popular either, although he's still running somewhere in the books. Who came, with the, who came up with the idea of making having Ant-Man become Giant Man? I'm embarrassed to say it was me. Let's go off the record for a second. Think that's a good enough place to leave it jimmy it's a heck of a place to leave it ed you know we come into these sections not sure what we're going to get we just got the stanley version of the creation of the marvel universe and i'm sure we're going to see interesting comments come back yes. regarding his version of these events but um you know that's what this is this is this is his version of this stuff and um wow what a, what a chunk of characters to roll roll through and uh talk about those origins briefly Wow. It's, uh, you know, this Four is... Four billion dollars worth of characters he just summarized right there. And and uh, it's interesting to think of, like, the different ways that, that he plotted it. Like, I have this character who has this thing. Let me have, like, a young character. Let me have a doctor. Let me have this or that. Uh, when when you read the earliest X-Men, it is real funny how, like, one for one the X-Men are with Fantastic Four. It's, like, replace the blonde with a redhead. Uh, the Beast, the sort of scientific kind of beast is comes around in about issue three it's like in the first couple issues he's a big uh, lummox and there's a very weird uh love triangle thing like like the the professor's in turmoil that he can't express his love to gene gray which doesn't exactly age great yeah sure uh but yeah pretty pretty cool to kind of you know get a little glimpse into his process big shame that uh this kind of material was reserved for a court courtroom full of millionaire lawyers who could kind of give a fuck, you know? It wasn't in the big, in, in front of a big uh, convention hall or something. I have to imagine, like, every one of those character descriptions, it just rolls. Yeah. And it feels like Stan must have described that a thousand times in yeah. front of these colleges, in front of conventions, um, you know, in, in bits and pieces of interviews throughout the years with right. fans and stuff. So this is amazing, He's and trained. I'm glad we've got it now. But I, I do think at least those parts, the, yeah. the creation parts, I bet you floated around in different uh, iterations over the years. Yeah, man. Super cool. Uh, we got about an hour in on this, man. Uh, we cleared a bunch of pages, 30-something pages. You know, we got about 60 pages to go worth of deposition, and uh, it's, it's getting exciting. That's a fun chunk, uh, and I'm curious to see where it goes from here. Um, all of this stuff to me is, it's, it's a Stanley account of, major comics history you know whether whatever your opinion of stan lee is 
I think is beside the point of like, this is a record we have of Stan Lee describing this stuff. So I'm excited by that. We're going to keep going on this deposition till the end, but K Fabers, we have so much stuff. In fact, uh, Mike Catron over at uh, Fantagraphics sent us some depositions and, and actual court testimony in the Wonder Man case with uh, Will Eisner, uh, DC Comics against Victor Fox for this Wonder Man thing. Uh, we saw the Wonder Man trial play out in Will Eisner's The Dreamer. It's a video that you can find on, on our channel. And uh, that thing is over 100 pages, talking to Max Gaines. I think Sigel and Schuster show up in, in, in the mix of this thing because they're on the DC side of the gimmick. Uh, Will Eisner, uh, all kinds of that's, people in that's that That's wild. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have uh, Todd McFarlane's deposition in the Neil Gaiman case. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we have uh, to unpack. And Kayfabers, if you have your hands on any kinds of depositions or know where to find them, you got to send them to the to the Kayfab uh, email address so that we can research and see if that uh, could satisfy the channel. A lot of people are confusing this back and forth deposition stuff with like comics journal interviews. They're like, yo, do the one from TCJ. And it's like, nah, 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 man. Like, like this is like public information, you know, public record uh, owned by everybody. Not, you know, Gary Groth's interview in TCJ issue 115. Good to go? Yes. Okay, favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What is out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design. Hits your local comic shop March 16th. Pre-order it now. Uh, subscribe to it now. Tell your local comic shop that you want a copy of Hulk Grand Design Monster. Um, you can join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can see some of my original art for Hulk Grand Design. You can see some of the process of how I make that comic. Uh, you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics. I ask you this, Jimmy. After today's uh, information, who created the Hulk? <laughs> no, Marvel. No. Marvel created the Hulk. You know, in my X Men comics, uh, it is by law like I have to put created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. You know what? Me too. And there I, it is. That, that's on the title page. I lettered that this week for both issues and made it big. Made those, you know, made the credits big for those two guys. So yeah, pretty awesome to uh, to, to get to hand letter that on the on page one. That's the fruits of these uh, testimonies and dep depositions. Red Room, uh, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Uh, the Anti-Social Network trade paperback is in stores today. Uh, that rep represents the 2021 season of Red Room Comics, but we're in 2022, Jimmy. Uh, March 9th begins Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one in the comic book stores. Every issue completely self-contained. Going to be coming out on a monthly basis. March and April are going to be cartoonist kayfabe months at the comic shops, man. Make sure you pre-order these comics. Order them from the, from the Fantagraphics website, however you get your comics. Uh, if you want to read these comics ahead of time, hit up my Patreon. I've been serializing Red Room strips for a couple of years now. Well over 200 pages and three bucks gets you the entire archive of all that stuff. We have link trees in the description below this video where you can uh, get to our comics and uh, our Patreons. And it's your support that keeps the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel flowing. Uh, what else do we have? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter, also at the links below this video. And you can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Showing up with the t-shirts and the, and the baseball caps, rocking the Cartoonist Kayfabe is a big help uh, to the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel also. Uh, Jimmy, give them those merchandise. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.